delighted to have Philip Ball all the way here from London. He's really one of the world's great science writers. He's really written on so many, so many aspects of science, from chemistry, biology. He's famous for his book on patterns. At first, the first when it first came out, it was called Nature's Tapestry. And now it's since been spun off and, and expanded and revised into three different books, Shapes, Branches, and what's the third one? Flow. Flow, all right, flow. Flow, shapes, <laughs> branches. Probably right here, it's not. So anyway, there's an interesting dichotomy going from the morning uh, session to now in that uh, in sexual selection in biology, it's often emphasized anything can be preferred by females of the species in, in all these cases. They could choose to like anything, any sort of weird thing. Is that really true? Or there's certain <laughs> patterns that nature has at a deeper root within chemistry, within physics, within mathematics itself. Are these the patterns from which beauty and the aesthetic are chosen from? You know, so, so I think in the next session, starting with Philip and then with Tyler, we're going to delve down deeper into the, the patterns of nature fundamental level, so I'd like to welcome Philip Ball. Thanks a lot. contribute to the zebra's fitness, then there's apparently no end 
of the just so stories that you can spin about what benefits they might confer. Now, I should make clear that I do suspect that the zebra stripes are adaptive. I suspect that there is some sound evolutionary reason why they're there, even if we don't really know what it is yet. However, there are three things, three warnings, perhaps, that I want to add to, to this story. The first is the objection that was raised by the, uh, by, uh, to this kind of explanation, this kind of adaptive explanation, um, by the Scottish zoologist. Darcy Thompson, in his classic book of 1917 on growth and form. This is Darcy Thompson here. I, we saw pictures of, of Wallace and Darwin a little while ago. They were all kind of interchangeable. It makes a bit of beer was going on at the end of the 19th century. Um, but um, Dar what, what uh, Darcy Thompson said, uh, or at least one way of reading this fantastic exploration of his of shape and pattern and form in, in nature, is that there are constraints imposed by the laws of physics and chemistry, which not only limit what biology might achieve, but also often provide a more immediate and satisfying explanation um, for what we find in the living world than invoking Darwinian origins. Now, it's not that the Darwinian explanation is wrong, or not necessarily that, but that it's incomplete. If we're content to say that we've explained the zebra stripes, if we can show that they somehow have some fitness benefit, uh, we still have failed to account for how these markings get put in place on any particular zebra, because it seems clear that the precise location of each dark band isn't fixed, isn't determined by genes. In other words, evolution might provide the why, but not the how of these stripes. Secondly, to assume that everything we see in the living world is an evolutionary adaptation, is it's a reasonable starting point, but um, it can become a lazy reflex that simply forecloses any further inquiry. Have a look, for example, at these patterns on mollusk shells. You see, they're wonderful, they're hugely varied, and yet, if we're going to look for adaptive explanations for them, then we start running up against some uncomfortable truths. Many marine mollusks spend essentially all of their lives buried in mud. So you don't see these patterns. <laughs> Others have these patterns on their shelves, but then they cover them up with an opaque coat of some kind of organic tissue, almost as though they're embarrassed by their own virtuosity. <laughs> Other kinds of mollusks have shell markings that, um, that individually might vary from, uh, between one, and, uh, one individual and another within the same species, with such variety, here's an example from a single species, that you can't really imagine how any of these species would recognize the other one as coming from the same species. Now, it's not impossible that even here, um, that there may be an adaptive explanation for these pigment markings in the shell. For example, it's been suggested that these bands and these spots and stripes uh, might incorporate unwanted waste products and so lock them away from the surrounding environment, from the water surrounding the organism itself, these toxic waste, waste products. But even then, if that's so, the patterns that result are largely a chance byproduct of that process and are subject to very little, if any, adaptive uh, evolutionary pressure, selective pressure. And under those circumstances, it's not fanciful to say that nature is at liberty to play, that it has something like an irrepressible impulse to create patterns, and that it does so even when there's no evolutionary need for them. And this leads me to my third point. Even if we accept that the zebra stripes have an adaptive function, we can't help but be struck by how they resemble some patterns that ev evidently don't have an evolutionary uh, uh, function to them because they form in non-living systems. And this seems to be a common theme in the natural in the patterns that we find in nature, that they come from a limited palette. We see the same patterns appearing again and again. So here are some other examples, stripes in nature. We see a lot of hexagons and honeycomb shapes in the living and non-living systems alike. Spirals are very common, and branches. Are these resemblances just coincidence, or is it something more? 
want to suggest to you that, at least uh, in the case of the zebra stripes, and, and in several others in the living world, the resemblance between these patterns and others we find elsewhere in the natural world probably aren't coincidental at all. Now, resemblances like this were noticed by Darcy Thompson. In fact, that was one of the key themes of, of his book. Um, and the, the, one of the patterns that he considered very briefly in his book, and this is taken straight from his book on the left-hand side here, are these patterns formed in a, in a chemical system. Um, and these structures are co caused by the periodic precipitation of a colored salt formed um, by the reaction of two compounds that have been infused into a gel in these columns. And, and, and uh, as, as the reaction proceeds, you get a, a sequential appearance of these, of these bands. And on the right-hand side, I just show a, a modern um, example of this experiment where they're slightly clearer. These are known as Lisegang rings, or Lisegang band bands, after the German chemist um, Raphael Eduard Lisegang, who discovered them in 1896. Darcy Thompson suggested that perhaps they might be related to the banded mineral formations that we see in agate and onyx. And some others suggested that these bands and stripes might represent a simplified version of the markings that we find on zebras and on tigers and on some butterflies. Now, that seemed to a lot of people a rather fanciful leap at, at, at the time, but it turned out to have more than a grain of truth. And the reason why emerged from work in a quite different area of chemistry uh, several decades later. In the 1950s, a Soviet biochemist named Boris Belusov was looking at the reaction of glycolysis, of how glucose gets broken down in our cells, in our bodies, in the process of metabolism. And he devised a mixture of chemical reagents that would mimic this process in a, in a simpler way, in a test tube. Um, so his reaction was a, a mixture that changed between yellow to begin with, and it went colorless as the reaction proceeded. But it didn't just stop there it went back to being yellow again, and then it went to being colorless again, and then to yellow, and back and forth, and it just kept oscillating back and forth. It was an oscillating chemical reaction. Now, this uh, seemed at the time to violate the second law of thermodynamics, and so other scientists weren't at all happy with this, and no one believed Belusov's oscillating reaction. He couldn't get the results published anywhere. He had to sneak them out in, a, in obscure conference proceedings. Um, it wasn't until uh, until this reaction was revisited in the 1960s by another uh, Russian biochemist, Anat Anatoly Jabotinsky, um, that anyone started to take them seriously. And part of the reason for that was that Jabotinsky found a way to modify this mixture to make the color change much more dramatic. So in Jabotinsky's version, it changed from being blue to red to blue to red. It just kept switching back and forth as the clock ticked on. And this was very, this, you could see this before your eyes. It was very hard to ignore ignore the fact that this was a real process. And we now know that this so-called Bronusov Shabatinsky reaction is just one example of a wide range of chemical processes that undergo oscillations. And in fact, the second law of thermodynamics isn't violated by them at all, because the oscillations don't go on forever. Eventually, they'll die away if you just leave this long enough, and it settles down to a steady state. And so that's all that thermodynamics cares about, what happens in the end. It doesn't say anything about how it gets there. These oscillations can be explained as a competition between two different intermediate states. So you can say a red one and a blue one that just switch back and forth. And the key here that uh, enables this back and forth switching is that both of these processes have feedback that speeds them up. They're autocatalytic. The more, if you like, the more red stuff there is, the more it, it speeds up its own um, creation. And eventually it does so in a runaway process that just exhausts itself. There's nothing else to react. And, and so at that point, it's exhausted. And it's also set up the conditions for a switch over to the blue state. And then that runs through the cycle as well until it exhausts itself and switches back. So this feedback, this, this, uh, this autocatalysis, is essential to the process. Now, uh, what, what's really going on here then is a competition between how quickly you can get, you can replenish all the ingredients you're using up by having them diffuse from further afield, and how quickly they react. It's a competition between diffusion and reaction. And this sort of system is now an example of what's known to chemists as a reaction diffusion system. Now, if the reaction is well mixed, as I've shown here, then this color change happens everywhere at once. But if it's carried out 
in a solution that's just left to sit quietly, particularly if you slow down the diffusion by actually putting it in a gel, like Nizagang did with his band, then what happens is that the color change can be initiated at different spots at random and then spreads from those in a kind of spreading wave. And because of these oscillations, those waves oscillate. They become a series of pulses. And what you get are these fantastic spatial patterns, these spiral and target waves spreading out like this. And um, these snapshots might put us in mind of the stripes of a tiger or a zebra, but uh, although they're more regular, obviously. But the crucial difference is that they're moving patterns, whereas the animal markings are stationary. But it turns out that a reaction diffusion system can also produce stationary patterns. And it's very apt that this gathering is, is happening um, not only this year, but actually this week, because this happens to be the anniversary, 100th anniversary, the centenary of the birth of the man who figured out how you can get stationary patterns in a system like that. And this is Alan Turing. And um, in fact, in this week's Nature, there's a, a, an exploration of the legacy that Turing uh, left us with. Turing's most famous for his work in decrypting the Enigma code uh, that was used by the German military forces during World War II. He's also credited as being a founding father of artificial intelligence, sort of laying some profound work, uh, found foundational work of uh, the, the whole field of computer science. <coughs> But Turing's curiosity was very diverse, and in 1952, two years before his death, he published a paper in which he attempted to explain how symmetry gets broken during the formation of a body plan in a fertilized egg. And what I mean by symmetry breaking here is that you start off with a perfectly symmetrical, a uniform system, if you like, a ball of identical cells, and somehow, some of these cells will decide, if you like, to become limbs and, uh, and eyes and uh, maybe a brain and so forth. Um, and some will, fo will follow other developmental routes. And so the problem is how this initially uniform state spontaneously starts to develop these patterns that, that differentiate one part from another. And you can see that this is precisely the same kind of problem, or at least it seemed to be, that, um, that we find with the zebra stripes, how you, a, a, an initially uniform patch of skin, um, how it gets broken up into patches that get pigmented and patches that don't. Now, the, Turing's theory of, of how this could happen was quite abstract and complicated, and it, was, and it was only in the 1970s that other scientists figured out what the crucial ingredients were. Turing suggested that the patterns could be created by two types of chemical substance, both of them diffusing through the system, and he called them morphogens, meaning literally meaning shape formers. One of them was uh, called an activator, and this was a stuff like the, as in the, uh, the blue sulfur jabotinsky reaction. This was a substance that was autocatalytic, that created more of itself, that, that amplified itself. Um, and the other one was an inhibitor, a substance that interrupted, interfered with that process, that process of self-amplification by the activator. And crucially, um, uh, what, what, uh, if the inhibitor diffuses at a rate that's faster than the activator, then you can get these, uh, the, the, these spatial patterns starting to arise. Essentially what's happening is that you can get little local blobs of activator that, that sort of um, uh, co co that, that, that go uh, that, that amplify themselves and that create um, uh, 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 an enhanced concentration there, but that the inhibitor stops that process from spreading too far, and so you can only get another blob a certain distance away. Um, now, Turing had to do all his calculations by hand, and so it's hard to see exactly what the kinds of patterns would be that this activator inhibitor scheme uh, would generate. Um, but when computers became available to do the number crunching, then it became clear that there are two generic types of pattern that uh, tier this Turing process forms, and they are spots and stripes. But no one was able to find a real chemical system in which this happened until 1990, when a, a, a group in France um, managed to, to generate these patterns here, these, these genuine Turing patterns in a chemical system. And the following year, um, uh, another group in Texas found a way to make them spread throughout an entire system. So these are not artificial colors. These are real chemical uh, ingredients here in the, at the bottom, spots and stripes being formed in these very regular patterns even though the ingredients, the molecules here, are diffusing throughout the whole system, and yet these stationary patterns remain. So Turing's theory did seem to offer, and still does seem to offer, the most plausible mechanism for many 
um, mark animal marking patterns. And the idea is that there are biochemicals that act like in activators and inhibitors, like these morphogens during the growth of the embryo, and they imprint the skin with patterns that either switch on or off pigment-producing genes. And so these, uh, the, these pigment-inducing morphogens would diffuse through the uh, skin of the developing embryos and lay down that pattern. And Turing-type models of this process have now been put, put forward to explain many of these different animal markings uh, that, that are actually you know, more complex than the ones in uh, the simple ones that I showed you earlier on. So these network structures like you see on giraffes and the, the kind of rosette structures that you see on, on jaguars and leopards and the structures on ladybirds. Um, one of the uh, clearest examples um, of this sort of process is found on the angelfish. The angelfish is interesting because the patterns there don't, aren't just laid down during growth and then just uh, you know, are fixed and sort of just blow up like a, an expanding balloon as the organism grows. They actually keep changing as the fish gets bigger. And you, you find in particular, you get these kind of little zip uh, uh, stripes that gradually unzip as the, as the fish gets bigger, and you see precisely the same kind of thing in a, a computer simulation based on a, a Turing type mechanism. However, no one has found, uh, for a system like this, no one has found the clinching proof, which would be to actually find the molecules that act as these morphogens. However, they do seem to have been found, or at least good candidates seem to have been found, in another kind of regular pattern that is formed um, in skin, and that is the formation of hair follicles. Um, in in, in uh, hair follicles in mice, although it seems reasonable to imagine that a similar process is happening in humans. So this rough, this almost sort of regular, quasi-crystalline sort of structure that you see in the hair follicles seems to possibly be laid down by um, Turing-type morphogens. There are several other candidates, uh, biological candidates for uh, for these uh, Turing patterns as well, and in fact. Um, Richard and Anna have, between them, uh, reminded me that another one is the, uh, the formation of feathers themselves. The barbs of feathers, these, re these very regular, uh, if you like, a sort of regular system of stripes, uh, seem quite plausibly to be uh, a Turing-type pattern that involves um, an activator that, uh, I, I don't know if Anna was here, but it was her favorite, uh, her favorite molecule, this SHH uh, molecule, the sonic hedgehog gene. Uh, which seems to, if you, I'm sure you will notice in her, um, her, her diagram of the genetic network, there was a little loop, a little arrow, going around on the sonic hedgehog in the middle, going back on itself. It's an activator. It's, it's self-amplifying. So it seems quite possible that that's acting as, a, as an activator in the formation of feather barbs. Um, but what then of this, this sim similarity um, between the stripes of a zebra and the stripes in windblown sand? Well, it's been argued that this, um, this generic process of interaction between a kind of localized activation, a self-amplifying activa activation, and a longer-range suppression or inhibition could be at work in the formation of a very wide range of natural patterns, and that this is one of them. Because if you think about it, um, if there's a, you imagine a flat surface of sand across which wind is blowing with sand grains uh, being carried in it. If by chance a little bump appears on that surface, just, but just because so, uh, a little bit more sand happens to be deposited there at some point, it sticks out above the rest and it starts to collect more grains. So the more it sticks out, the more grains it collects, and it's self-amplifying, it starts to grow. At the same time, by collecting those grains, it depletes the wind of the grains, um, uh, of grains in that vicinity. And so another bump can't grow until it's a certain distance away from that one. And so you get another one growing, then another and another in this more or less regular uh, pattern. Well, this is basically what's going on. The actual process is a little more complicated than that. You have to take into account that the great sand grains don't actually just fall, uh, stop where they fall. They perform a series of little jumps. And it seems to be the size of those jumps that sets the size of the, of the ripples. And there are several other patterning processes going on at the same time in the desert, uh, because we see several other uh, uh, features, several other pattern features growing on top of these larger scale structures, sand dunes. And uh, these don't just appear as a, a series of sort of linear structures like the sand ripples. They have a whole variety of different shapes. So you can have these linear ones, or in fact, in this case, they're more sort of uh, wavy. These are actually called seaf dunes, and you see with the ripples superimposed on top of them. You can also get these crescent-like shapes called barkan dunes, or many-armed shapes called star dunes. 
And it turns out that if you alter gravity and alter the wind speed, which doesn't sound like an easy thing to do, but you can do it on Mars, then you find quite different shapes coming, uh, sand dune shapes appearing. And this is what we find on Mars. This is a, a real picture of a, a strange kind of dune formed on Mars that we don't find anywhere on Earth. And all of these shapes can be reproduced in computer models of this process that are basically models of this activation and inhibition. Well, I think the key point here that I want to stress is that the patterns that we're seeing here don't respect the normal boundaries that we draw between the living and the non-living worlds. The patterns are governed by rules that are mathematical, not genetic, or even explicitly chemical. And as far as living nature is concerned, this implies that the, the constraints and the possibilities extend beyond the, 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 the purely functional. Now, I'm not aware, as I say, that anyone will argue uh, with the idea that the zebra stripes are an adaptation, but also no, no, no one will argue that they are a particularly finely tuned adaptation. That's to say exactly how the stripes fork and, uh, and merge, how their width varies on different parts of the body, um, and why they're only roughly regular. All of these seem to be features determined more by the mathematics of the general scheme by which they're made, and not by the demands of evolution. So long as these features, these variations, aren't significant impediments to fitness, they can survive. Even They can, they can even be toyed with and elaborated uh, by nature without any uh, obviously evolutionary function. And I'm reminded in all of this of what Vladimir Nabokov said about butterfly patterns. Now, you may know that before he became a famous novelist, Nabokov was a professional lepidopterist. He was actually curator at uh, Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology, and he knew an awful lot about butterflies. And like Darcy Thompson, he wasn't fully satisfied with Darwinian explanations for how they get their patterns. Nabokov suspected that there might be other imperatives at work. After all, this mimicry seems sometimes to go much further than it had any adaptive reason to. This is what Nabokov said about it. He said, when a butterfly has to look like a leaf, not only are all the details of the leaf beautifully rendered, but markings mimicking grub board holes are generously thrown in. Natural selection in the Darwinian sense could not explain the miraculous coincidence of imitative aspect and imitative behavior, nor could one appeal to the theory of the struggle for life when a protective device was carried to a point of mimetic subtlety, exuberance, and luxury far in excess of a predator's power of appreciation. I discovered in nature the non-utilitarian delights that I sought in art. Both were a form of magic. Both were a game of intricate enchantment and deception. Now, this all sounds perhaps a little too mystical or even uh, or a little too whimsical for some tastes. Nabokov has sometimes been accused of verging on almost a sort of creationist point of view. But there's something in his perception that butterfly wing patterns are not just the result, are not the result of random doodles that chance upon some evolutionarily successful design. That perhaps instead they're variations on a theme determined by the constraints of a pattern-forming process in which we can see intimations, at least, of Turing's mechanism. And now, it's pure anthropocentric whimsy that makes me illustrate that point this way. <laughs> These are all natural patterns found on butterfly wings. Uh, but I hope that it will make you appreciate that, uh, that nature seems able to do a lot with a few general rules. And the question that I want to leave you with is whether perhaps sometimes she contrives to do more than, than she strictly needs to. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. We can handle a few questions here. can't see anybody, but... So has anyone followed um, the zebra during development to look at changes in RNA localization and, and protein? I'm not sure which proteins are involved, but maybe you could try and follow it over development? Yeah. Um, for the zebra, 
I'm not sure if they have. I think a lot of work now is going on in, in um, species like the angelfish and other pattern fish. Uh, I may be wrong, but for, I haven't seen any work specifically for the Deborah to, to know what's going on there. Um, but for the fruit fly, it's an interesting case because the fruit fly, in the early stages, the embryo develops a series of bands. And you know, there are some people who sort of looked at these and thought, sure, it's stripes, it must be. And it turns out that it's not. That that's a system that, that um, is both, in some ways, both more complex and more simple than, uh, than what's uh, going on with Turing. In particular, because the stripes that aren't identical, they don't sort of have identical uh, fates. And so I think it was that realization that actually led to a bit of skepticism about whether Turing patterns have any role. Because, you know, here was an example where it looked, really looked like they did, and then it seemed that they didn't. Um, but, uh, but, but I think in some of these other um, uh, um, examples that I mentioned, uh, you know, it seems that there, there is a, uh, a good case to be made that at least something like diffusing morphogens um, and uh, autocatalytic feedback or self-activation uh, does lie at the root of some of the patterning processes. Um, I wonder if you could speculate a little bit about Nabokov's whimsical comment about imitation. I mean, do you think that what we're seeing there is just parallel processes? That, or is there some interaction actually between the butterfly and the, the environment that it's on? Yeah, um, Nabokov certainly knew. Uh, so, sorry, yeah, yeah. That, that um, uh, it, whether I could um, um, spec, uh, whether I could amplify what uh, what Nabokov said about this this apparent um, uh, fidelity in the mimicry that some butterfly species um, show, and. Uh, I'm afraid I, I probably can't. I mean, <laughs> Nabokov knew an awful lot more than, than, than I did about this. Uh, of course, a lot of the mimicry that we see in butterflies you know, does have a very clear evolutionary function, that there were some butterflies are mimicking either poisonous species, um, you know, where they're not poisonous themselves, um, or, you know, or, 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 um, or, or that there are other clearly um, uh, adaptive processes that are going on, that they're sort of mimicking each other. When they're mimicking something, when it's, when it's sort of camouflage like this, I don't, I mean, Richard, I'm sure, will, will, will have much more uh, insight into this than I have. I don't know what to say about Nabokov's view there, um, that, that, you know, that the, the, the mimicry is, is sort of be much better than it needs to be. Um, I don't even know whether he was right to, to say that, um, but certainly, you know, from this um, outsider's point of view, you can see what he's driving at, that some of the mimicry of dead leaves and so on seems extraordinary, um, and it seems extraordinary you know, to a degree that you can't imagine a, a predator, you know, needing in order to be confused that way. Um, but I'm afraid I can't really uh, say much more than that. I know there are other people here who I'm, I'm sure could. One more. Um, I have one question in regard to all the other um, papers we had in the morning session. And this is, first, I, I like the paper very much, and I think it brought another aspect in it. And I'm very curious to hear a little bit more about um, if you relate the stripes to curing, and if I understand curing correct, right, he's developing an idea which is completely independent from its environment, and the machine is constantly repeating and with that activating itself. That's very interesting because in the morning session we had a lot, we heard a lot of papers that whatever um, the scientists were talking about, they related it to the environment and how relevant the environment is also mimicry and so on and everything we have heard for um, their, their theory. And we've once heard, for instance, the relevance of the Umwelt from Uxkull. Now, if I understand you right, do you want for what we have with the stripes of the zebra is an autopoietic system which just develops it by itself without any reference to the environment? Um. No, not quite. I, I have no doubt that whatever a Turing type mechanism or any other patterning mechanism might produce is then subject to selection, without, without a doubt. Um, it's a question of how much selection. And, you know, I think that there was, are certainly some systems, whether this is true of the zebra or not, I don't know, I suspect not, but there are some systems like the seashells where the selection that it will be subject to is very weak or perhaps non existent. Um, and, you know, and in that case, uh, it really is the case that nature, if you like, can play 
um, that, that all of these structures can, can come about you know, without, um, uh, purely through their own dynamics. There's nothing that's going to be sort of, you know, winnowing them, them down. So I think that's really the question. There's always going to be, you know, for any organism, there's always going to be selective pressure, and the question is really how much. And if there isn't much, then, you know, you can see some interesting things going on that won't necessarily be Darwinian. All right. Sorry, we must move on. Thank you a lot.